If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. We'll be covering the first 14 verses there. 1 Corinthians 12. I want to speak to you tonight about a New Testament church. A New Testament church. And, uh, you know, pretty much ever since I've been here, uh, I've tried to model the Acts chapter 2 church and uh, follow that model because it's a biblical model for church growth. And so let me go ahead and give you the outline to tonight, uh, New Testament church. Number one, the importance of the Holy Spirit. The importance of the Holy Spirit. Folks, it is extremely important in a New Testament church. Without the Holy Spirit, I'm just telling you, we're just meeting, okay? It's more of a club, uh, and we need the Holy Spirit. Number two, the importance of spiritual gifts. The importance of spiritual gifts. Everyone that is saved, God has given you a spiritual gift, and I will be speaking about that. Number three, the importance of unity. All right, the importance of unity. These three things, the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, and unity are all extremely important. You know, the Apostle Paul speaks of the body of Christ uh, as the church in his writing. He also describes the church as a family, an army, a temple, and a bride. When we understand our physical bodies, it helps us understand the spiritual body of Christ. Now, we won't cover that part of it uh, because it's the rest of the chapter, uh, but you will see how, you know, all of our functions, our body, everything that our body does uh, is important to the body as a whole. Each part of our bodies have a specific function, just as God has given us the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He also gives us the Holy Spirit the very day we are saved. With his, Holy, with his Holy Spirit, God gives us spiritual gifts to use for his glory and for the glory of his church. Let's look at this amazing teaching about the body of Christ and the New Testament church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And again, Paul wasn't trying to be kind of tacky there or rude. Uh, he was just saying, you know, like new Christians probably wouldn't even understand that and don't even know that, okay? And there's a, you know, uh, ignorance is just not knowing, not taught, okay? Stupidity is knowing and making the wrong decision, okay? Just saying, I really don't care what the Bible says. I don't really care, you know, anything about that. So he was just talking about it. And you have to realize uh, the church at Corinth was not a, uh, you know, what, what I would call a model church, there were several things going on in that church, which, again, if you just have read any of the Corinthians, uh, you would know there were several shortfalls in that. And uh, even uh, one of the descriptions is carnal Christians. All right, And me personally, I don't even like those two words mixed in together. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's either you know, one that really did not make a, a decision or you know, a, a true a profession of faith, or somebody that is a new Christian and hasn't grown or knows any better. Verse 2, you know that uh, you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, and Paul really is not missing words here, okay? Uh, that would be offensive to some people in that day, but he's just simply saying, you know, before you got saved, you just didn't know any better, okay? You were doing what the world does. You were doing what you want to do. All right, however you uh, how, carry away these dumb idols, however you were led. Uh, you didn't take God uh, into consideration. The Holy Spirit wasn't inside of you before salvation. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And basically he is talking about the lost man versus the saved man or woman. I, I'm not excluding them. I'm simply saying it's two different things. A lost man does not have the Holy Spirit guiding him in his life. So if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him, then he's not saved. He has not taken Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. All right? So he acts that way because that's, you know, literally who he is. And, of course, 
you know, accepting Jesus Christ into your life, uh, you know, it's the greatest decision that you can ever make. And the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is put inside of you. Verse 4, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit, okay? You know, it's the Spirit of Christ, that, it's that common denominator that we have in our own lives. All kinds of gifts. Matter of fact, uh, we'll probably look uh, at 19 different gifts that is listed in three different passages, okay? And diversity is good in this uh, setting and what they are saying here. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So now, if you look back through here, you've already seen God, okay, God, you've seen you know, the Trinity, you've seen Jesus, and now you see the Holy Spirit. And those are very, very important in a New Testament church. There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. And the, the activities are really ministries, is what he's talking about. And every ministry, and, and I want to say this, not one ministry is more important than the other ministry. I don't care if it's a children's ministry, youth ministry, senior adult ministry, outreach ministry. They're all equal in God's eyes. They are all important to a New Testament church. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And folks, you can have the Spirit of God in you, and especially for young Christians but if you not if you not had time to grow spiritually, the manifestation may not be showing. Okay, and what he is saying is those seasoned veterans, those people that have been saved a long time, all right, they should not be critical of new Christians. Okay, uh, they should manifest more of the Holy Spirit because they've been saved longer. Okay, they've grown in the Lord, they've matured in the Lord. So sometimes. Uh, people can say, and I'll give you a perfect example. There was a, ha happened at, at, at our church. Well, let me just say one of the churches. I almost said the church that I had been a part of. A guy had a ponytail. And folks, now it's back in the 80s. You know, nowadays, you know, it's, it's more prevalent is all I'm saying. And he got saved. And he got baptized. And about two weeks later, he came to us, and, and his name happened to be Mike too. And he said, I had... A uh, senior adult tell me that since I got saved, I need to cut my ponytail. And I said, really? And I tried to get him to understand, you know, that, you know, you know different things, people uh, interpret Scripture differently. And I said, because the bottom line is, folks, you know, wh how you wear your hair doesn't change who you are on the inside, okay? I mean, when I got my hair cut short just a couple of weeks ago, I mean, I bet the first Sunday 25 people said, you got a haircut, okay? And like I didn't sit in the chair, and I don't know it. And what, what I'm saying is we can't look at the outside of somebody that has no bearing on what that person is, all right? It's kind of like a Christian biker. Let me give you a secret. There are Christian bikers, okay? They don't look at the guy I ride with from Alma. If you looked at him, you would think, ooh, that dude kind of scares me, all right? He teaches Sunday school, folks. All right, he just looks like a biker. He loves the Lord. He witnesses. He's part of a Christian organization. So he's just simply saying, you don't know who has the Holy Spirit. You, and everyone gifts is important, everyone. But the most important thing, this Sunday when we meet here, the most important thing is the Holy Spirit. That's what set churches apart. Okay, there are some churches... And, and again, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying, when you go to their services, I've preached revivals where I'm thinking, this is, it's not here. The, it, you know, it's dead. It's just, there's nothing. There's no life in that. All right? And so what he's talking about, for a church to function like it needs to, there has to be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I've had people that joined in the last two years I had one said that they came in the door right over there, and I had another one come in the door. They said, we came for the first time, and before we walked through the sanctuary doors, we could feel the presence of God here. Folks, that's the most important thing. Okay, yes, we have wonderful music. Yes, I believe we have Bible-based preaching, but it is the Holy Spirit that makes a new 
Testament church. Philippians 2. Look at Philippians 2 with me. Philippians 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Number one, we don't need to judge others whether they're saved or not. Folks, that's not our business. Okay, I'm not here telling you who's saved and who's not. That is God's business. That's the Holy Spirit's business. That's their business. Okay, what he is saying, and really he's talking about the sanctification process. You know who I need to deal with? I need to deal with me. Okay, I don't need to say, well, he's probably, and folks, I've heard people say, that. they're probably not even a Christian. Well, how do you know? Okay, give people the benefit of the doubt there. Don't judge people. Okay, don't judge people. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now here it is. For it is God who works in you. You are who you are because of God. Because of the Spirit of God. You have been set apart. You have been placed in the church. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And I'm telling you, if we obey this rule, I, I'm just telling you, it would even be better if everyone just considered just themselves, all right? Just themselves when they walk in, that they're right with God, all right? Uh, that, that the manifestation of the Spirit would be so strong. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do good for His pleasure. His pleasure. All right, so even in the area of spiritual gifts, I'm telling you, it is God who gives you that gift. All right, and, and again, we will speak about that uh, right now. So we see the importance of the Holy Spirit in a New Testament church. The second thing, I want you to see the importance of spiritual gifts. And I know, folks, there are times... And there's a lot of times I've talked to people and I ask them what their spiritual gift is, and they don't have an answer. Okay? They don't have an answer. If you don't know your spiritual gift, you need to know. Because, uh, you know, in functioning in church, if you are not functioning where your spiritual gift is given, then you could be frustrated because you are working outside what God gave you, the spiritual gift for you. For instance, some people, all right, I mean, I know me personally, you know, it's, I love my grandkids, okay? But to spend eight hours like Lori does with my grandkids on a Friday, folks, I'm getting on my bike first, okay? I'm getting on it. I'm riding. I'm coming home. Why? But again, I love my grandkids, but it, my gift, for instance, I'll just tell you, y'all know what my gift My gift is prophecy, okay? It's preaching. It's it's proclaiming the Word of God. And it doesn't mean that I don't have other gifts. And I will say this right off the bat. All of us have the potential to use other gifts even though they aren't our strength. For instance, when you go on a mission trip, okay, and I've been on a bunch of mission trips, you need all the spiritual gifts functioning to be effective on a mission trip. And there's times that God asks you to do something that's out of the norm, okay, so that that, that ministry, that ministry glorifies God in, and helps in the function of that. But in general, in general, you need to work inside that strength and that spiritual gift. And folks, I don't think people are limited to one, all right? Most people have two or three. They have one strength and two or three that they do really well. And all these things are for God's glory, okay? Look at, look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 7. No, verse 8, excuse me. Uh, uh, for to one is given uh, uh, the word of wisdom through the Spirit. So one of, one of the gifts is wisdom. And folks, the only way you're going to get that is in the Word. You have to be in the Word because the Word, I mean, God wrote a whole book on Proverbs, which is wisdom. All right, and wisdom is a gift uh, of, from God. Uh, but notice what it says, through the Spirit. Okay, just reading your Bibles are not good enough. Okay, you have to study your Bible. You have to let the Holy Spirit speak to you through, you, through the Bible. To another, knowledge. Through the same Spirit. Okay, another is faith. All right, and, 
and some people say, well, you know, I don't have a lot of faith. Well, folks, I'm telling you, you have more faith than you even give yourself credit for. All right? If you eat out once every two weeks, think about this. You don't know who prepares your food. You don't know what they put in your food. You don't know what has been done to your food. You don't know how old your food is. But we sit down, and we eat a meal, and we, that's smacking good. What did you do? You just use, you just use faith. That is a faith. So we have more faith. And, and, and I will say this, that is one gift you can develop. Okay, you can develop faith. Faith comes by the hearing of the Word. Faith comes through obedience. Faith comes through prayer. All right? To other, the gifts of healing. Healings by the same Spirit. Notice the, the, the equal thing there. Every one of them is the same Spirit. Okay, it is the Spirit of God that gives these, us these gifts. And again, I will say, just right off the bat, my opinion is many of the gifts, uh, you know, I, I think they were apostolic gifts to start that church. For instance, I do not believe man has the gift of healing. And I know there's pastors on TV, I understand people that pray, that have prayer tunnels and all that, I'm, I don't knock that, but I personally believe the healing comes from God, and our job is uh, to do the praying, and God does the healing. All right? To another, the working of miracles. And again, I, I don't think our job is to raise the dead, but do you realize every time somebody gets saved, it's a miracle? And we can do that. If you share the gospel with, some, with somebody, and they get saved, I'm telling you, you were part of a miracle of God. And it says, to other prophecy, and I spoke of that, to another a discerning of spirit. This is probably my second gift. My strength is prophecy. I have discerning. Folks, I know I, I, I can smell a skunk a mile off. I know when people are lying to me most of the time. Discerning of spirits uh, uh, is, is, a, is a gift. And to a different kind of tongues... And again, 1 Corinthians 14, you can just go after the love chapter. It talks about tongues, uh, and we have to do it the biblical way, all right? I know some people, what I believe are strong believers, pray with tongues. I, I know some of them personally, all right? And I'm not challenging them. They're calling them out. But in the public setting, folks, I'm, I'm just saying it has to be done. Uh, the Bible says indecency in chapter 14, in order, and there has to be inter an interpreter there, okay? And the deal, and, and again, I know I'm getting this, I'll, I'll just use this as a sideline, okay? If somebody is speaking in tongues and nobody knows what that person is saying, what good is that, okay? We will naturally say, well, they may, they may be really filled. Okay, I'm just filled with the Spirit, and they're really filled with the Spirit. I had a, I had a preacher, a Pentecostal preacher, I'll just... Tell you who he was, because it happened to me personally. Said that I was not filled with the Spirit because I didn't speak in tongues. And we had quite a discussion about that. You know what we decided? We decided he was wrong and I was right. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we decided, because he was a personal friend, I just said, listen, there's no reason for us to talk about that. Okay, you do your thing, I'll do mine, and we'll go on. To another interpretation of tongues. But the one and the same Spirit works in all these things. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. I want you to see uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Oh, go down to verse 27, excuse me. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. And there's all kinds of words all kinds of definitions for apostles. I think the biblical New Testament definition is one who had seen the risen Christ. Okay, but there's apostolic churches. There are preachers that call themselves apostles, and I'm, I'm, I'll just leave it at that. Second prophets, we've talked about that. Third teachers, okay? Folks, I'm telling you, teaching is a gift from God. It is a gift. I, I do not think teaching is one of my primary gifts. I told you what I felt like my first two. Now, I do teach. I teach when I preach, all right? But I'm not the guy that's got a library with 450 books in it. 
I don't look at a text and look at not nine books at it, okay? I, I'm just saying, you know, the people that have that gift of teaching, they are the diggers, they are the detail people, they are the ones that will spend hours doing that, okay? And I thank God for people. We have people in the church that have the gift of teaching, and I thank God for that. Miracles we've talked about, healings we've talked about, helps, okay? A lot of that is service, all right? If you like to serve others, you have the gift of helps, all right? And administrations, uh, I think that definition uh, is good. Someone who is orderly, uh, you know, a lot of times, folks, I was at Fort Sill. I worked with the military all the time. A lot of the military, some of it is trained, uh, but a lot of them have administrations as their gifts and the varieties of tongue. Verse 29, are, are all a are all apostles? The answer is no. Prophets? No. Teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And what he's saying is, you don't, I mean, you don't pray. It's kind of like the Lord's Prayer. We don't say, okay, God, you know, the, the model prayer, however you want to say it. All right? It's, you know, as it's done in heaven, you know, it, it's, God's will. I know people that uh, have surrendered to the ministry. I know people that have uh, tried to preach. And again, I'm not saying it was horrible. I'm just saying a lot of them quit because that was not their spiritual gift. They can work in a church. You can be a lay person and operate in that gift. And I'm telling you, you will help the church greatly, greatly. Look at Romans 12. Go to Romans 12 with me. Romans 12, verse 3. Romans 12, 3. For I say to you, through the grace given to me and to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but soberly, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. All right? Basically, it says if you have a gift from God, you don't need to be prideful about it. You need, don't need to boast about it. Okay? I met a guy one time. I was a youth minister, and I was thinking about you know, they asked me as a youth minister, possibly on the staff, and met him, and he was a doctor, okay? And I didn't use the doctor word, you know? I mean, you know, I don't know, I was 25, 26 years old, and I didn't use that, and he basically said, young man, when you address me, you will call me doctor. And boy, that, that just didn't set well. I'm thinking, okay, and folks, I understand what it takes to be a doctor. I'm I've been through the education process. I respect anyone that has doctor, all right? But, but the, the part of that is that, you know, you can't let it get to your head. And, and again, I will say this. There was another thing that happened at a restaurant that God just says, uh, you, you need to move on, okay? Just move on. This, this is not it. And he's just saying, do not be egotistical with that. Do not, you know, demand things of people, all right? And here's the deal, folks. Even... In education, it is God that gives you that gift. I, I, I covet people that have the memory gifts. Folks, I have to go over it and over it and over it, over it. Okay, and I'm just saying, and I know covet's not the right word. I'm simply saying, you know, that is a gift from God. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but uh, all the members do not have the same function. So being many, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay, we're all in the church. We're all in the church together, all right? We all have functions, but we are the body of Christ. Verse 6, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith. In ministry, let us use it to ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. Folks, we need the gift of exhortation. People that encourage others. We live in a, a just a negative world. And folks, our people are just longing for love. Our people are longing uh, for compliments. All right? An exhorter is a great gift to have. He who gives liberally. Folks, we have several. We have many people in our church. Our finances. I'm just telling you, God blesses. We need people with the gift of giving in our churches. He who leads with diligence. All right, we need leaders. All right, leaders are critical. A church 
uh, thrives and falls many times uh, behind leadership. You get a pastor that just messes up big time and, you know, uh, leaves in a negative manner or because of some issue or like that, it hurts the church. It takes a church time to, to, to heal and, and do that. So the gift of leadership is so important with diligence and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And mercy and, and, and you know, exhorting are two that every church needs. Okay, you got those who have prophecy. And here's the deal, folks. Because I have the gift of prophecy, sometimes the gift of mercy doesn't mix well with that. You have one, they'll say, well, it's black and white. Well, the Bible says this. Well, let's, let's discipline them. Let's throw them out of this church. Okay, why? Because I'm a black and white Christian. You know, and I've heard that. Okay, and I understand that. I, I do. But then you have your mercy saying, man, let's give them a second chance. Why are you so hard on that person? And if we're not careful, what we will do is we'll, we'll start clashing with the gift as God given us. And folks, when we start doing that, Satan is winning that battle. Okay, most divisions in churches go over something that is going on like that. All right, and I'm telling you, when a church divides, Satan is one. He is one. So use your gift, know your gift, Use it wisely. Use it wisely. Then the last set uh, in these, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and the gifts. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. There's that one. We, that hasn't been in the other two lists. But I'm telling you, folks, there are people that have the gift of evangelism. It doesn't mean you shouldn't evangelize. Scott Warren has the gift of even If you've ever watched him on a mission trip or just ever watched him in a park, that dude can turn any conversation into a gospel presentation. He is amazing. Really, I've probably personally in my whole lifetime, in 40 years of ministry, I can only think of four people that I know that I truly think in three churches that literally have the gift of evangelism. Does it mean we don't need to evangelize? It's their gift. You know what we need to do? And that's what we do here. Hey, folks, he's the one training, you know, how to witness without fear. He's the trainer, and if you need to get with him and learn. We all need to have some evangelism in our lives. Uh, some pastors, some teachers, some for the equipping of the saints, okay, uh, for ministry. That's discipling, folks. We need disciplers in our church, people that will be patient with new Christians, teach people that would teach uh, and show and and uh, you know emulate uh, uh, ministry, the edifying of the body, the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body. Verse thirteen: Till we all come into the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of God. You know what God wants for our church? Everyone to know their spiritual gift, everyone to be functioning in that spiritual gift, and everyone to be mature in our spiritual gift. And again, it says perfect, but it simply means mature. We're not going to be perfect. We aren't perfect people, and we don't have a perfect church. I promise you. I'm in it. Okay? So we don't have a perfect church. So you have to understand all these gifts. And I forgot to say earlier here, I just... Saw a tag here. There's three categories. Some people break these gifts into three categories if you want to jot these down. Speaking gifts. Speaking gifts is one. Sign gifts. Signs, the miracles, uh, you know, and those. And serving gifts. Uh, those are the three that some people break those down to. So we see the importance of the Holy Spirit. We see the importance of spiritual gifts. And we see the importance of unity. The importance of unity. Look back in our text. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 12. For as the body is one, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body is one, being many are one body also in Christ. I'm telling you, harmony in the church will show manifestation of the Spirit. All right? I heard of this, and, and I know this preacher. He was in rural Texas, 
And he said when he got to the church, there was two sides of the church. And one group was sitting on one side and one group of people was sitting on the other. And he just said, when he first came there, it, there was just tension there. He said, man, I didn't know what was going on. All right? And you know what it came out to be? It turned out to be one, one set of family, and not just that family, but they had literally had words and had problems. And he just said, man, you know, you could just cut the atmosphere with a knife. And he just kept preaching and kept preaching and kept preaching. All right? And something, a tragedy had to happen in the church to unite that church. Folks, I'm just telling you, you know, he don't always choose tragedy, but I think it's a tragedy that that has to happen. Okay? So unity in the body of Christ. And again, unity is not uniformity, okay? We're not always going to agree on everything. Just like our body lifetime, folks, you can say what you want, you can give your opinion, all right? You can say, this is what I think, but once it's all said and done, what the church decides to do, whoever you are, whatever it's about, you need to get behind that, all right? And you need to and go with it 100%. Unity in the body of Christ. I'm telling you, disunity, not only just split, it hurts the ministry of the church. And you know why? Because, folks, the world is watching. The world is watching us. Verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. And again, you know, that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is, which is uh, in all Christians. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink of one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, and I close with this. Ephesians 4. I love this scripture. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Paul referred to himself many times uh, in his epistles uh, that way. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. Walking worthy basically means being Christ-like. Being Christ-like. With lowliness, folks, we need to be humble. All right, we need to be humble. We need to be gentle, gentleness, with long-suffering, patient, bearing one another. What does that mean? Folks, give people the benefit of the doubt. Okay, if somebody says something against somebody else, don't just assume that's true. Okay, don't assume that. Don't just take, you know, you know the side, you know. And really, folks, there shouldn't be sides in churches. There shouldn't be. Bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And again, folks, I, I haven't preached this because I think there's a problem in our church. All right? If there is, I don't know about it. And if I don't know about it, just let, leave me alone, okay? Just let me, let me just be happy, all right, uh, in that. No, it's seriously, if you can't work it out, Matthew chapter 18, there's ways that we ought to do it, all right? Verse 4, here it is. There's one body, and that's the body of Christ. One spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. Just as you called one hope of your calling. Oh, folks, man, hope is what everyone needs. And it's not one of those, well, I hope the Lord comes again. All right, that hope is, man, I'm telling you, the Lord's coming. I'm telling you, the Lord's coming. I don't know when he's coming, but he is coming. One Lord, that's Jehovah God of the Bible. One faith, one baptism. And that's why I say this. I got baptized once. I got dunked twice. I got dunked at the age of five. got dunked at the age of 14 because my life didn't change. I did not have a true salvation experience. I got scripturally baptized when I was 22 years old. One God and Father all. I love this. Who's above all, through all, and in you all. Whew. I'm about going to shout here, okay? I know it's Wednesday night. I need to be a little calmer. Above all, folks, there's nobody above God. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. Through all, in all of us. Folks, I hope you understand how powerful a New Testament spirit-filled church is to the kingdom of God. I mean, think about the disciples. God and Jesus rocked this world with 12 men. 
12 men rocked it, rocked that, you know, in those days. It was just amazing. Above all, through you all, and in you all. And there's so much I could say about in you all, folks. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. All right, he doesn't say, okay, I'm taking the spirit away, folks. I don't believe the Bible teaches, you know, that you can lose your salvation. All right, now you can hurt your fellowship, but I'm telling you, you'll always be saved according to the Word of God. And I want to say the key, and, and let me say this too, okay? I just saw this on my notes. There's no competition in churches. None. We shouldn't compare ourselves to one another. One ministry shouldn't be compared in competing with another. Folks, we're all on the same team. All on the same team. And everyone in the church should be using their spiritual gifts in service for God's glory. And folks, I'm just telling you, and even the people that are listening online, you need to know what your spiritual gift is. Folks, we have all kinds of surveys. You can go online and you can find spiritual gift surveys. You can go to the new members class. Steve's got copies of those if you have never filled out a spiritual gift survey. And you need to know what your gift is. And we as Christians need to be functioning in a local New Testament church using our spiritual gifts. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for a New Testament church. God, I thank you that I believe that we are. We're not the perfect church, but I do believe we are a New Testament church. And God, I pray that we would understand uh, it's not just the singing, it's not just the preaching, uh, it's not just being friendly. While all of those are important, God, it's the importance of the Holy Spirit. God, we need you here. We want you here. Uh, Lord, we can't have church without you. Lord, we need your spirit presence in every service that we have. And God, thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Uh, Lord, I just think in the music area, we are so blessed. And in the teaching area, we are so blessed. Uh, Lord, in the individual ministries, uh, we are blessed. And God, I pray that we will all just function in the gifts that you have given us. And God, I pray that our motive would be to do it for the glory of God and for the growing of the New Testament church. God, again, I don't know of any uh, disunity, but Lord, I pray that you would keep us uh, just close to you, united. Lord, I pray it be one accord. And God, I pray when people even say Rye Hill Baptist Church, uh, that they would say, man, I heard that's a good church. Uh, I, I heard a lot of good things about that, the church. And God, what we will do is we will talk to them and we will tell them, man, it's you, it's God. We're going to give God the, uh, the glory for everything. Every good and perfect gift is a gift from God. So God, thank you that we can be a part of, Lord, a New Testament church and not only a part of a New Testament church, we can be a part of the bride of Christ. God, one day we're going to all be in heaven, all be in heaven, and we are going to worship freely, freely. We're going to worship a long, long time. And God, it's going to be the most awesome thing we've ever seen or done in our lives. And God, we look forward to that. Thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.